So when we talk about the patient's size, it doesn't mean that the person is necessarily obese or overly large. It could be that a small child is trying to rescue a large, normal adult. And this difference in size can create its own problems. I always encourage my students to remember that if they, for whatever reason, cannot do an adequate chest compression because it takes an extra amount of pressure or more weight than the rescuer has to do the 2 to 2.4 effective depth for the chest compression, it's always good to call 911, get help on the way, but also maybe recruit another rescuer as a bystander. Get help from other people. Maybe there's another larger person that you could teach how to do those chest compressions to. They're very simple, but they could actually become your liaison and be able to do that effective chest compression when you may not be large enough to do it yourself. Now in this segment, we're gonna cover adult CPR. Now this is about an 18 year old male. Witnesses say that he was playing basketball when suddenly he start, started to lose his balance he clutched his chest and collapsed to the floor and was not responsive. We find him on the floor the same way they described it. Now, before we get into actually doing the CPR skills, we still want to make sure that the scene is safe. He did not step on an electric cord. He, there were no gases in the area that made him collapse. Once we can be sure that the scene is safe, we make sure our gloves are on, our CPR shield with a one-way valve is available, and now we can begin with our taps and shouts. So we tap and shout on the collarbone, sir, are you all right, are you okay? He does not respond to our taps and shouts and he's not apparently breathing normally at all. So we're gonna go ahead and activate EMS, you in the plaid shirt, go call 911 and come back. If you see an AED, please bring it back with you. If there's nobody to go call 911 for you and you have a cell phone, dial 911, hit the speaker phone button and leave it on so that the dispatcher can coach you through the CPR along the way. But now, because we know he's unresponsive, not breathing normally, I'm gonna go straight into my CPR compressions. A few pieces to note here when we talk about the chest compressions. The landmark we're looking for to do chest compressions is the first palm between the center of the chest, between the nipple line, on the lower third of the sternum. We wanna be sure to interlock our top hand over the first hand, keeping our elbows locked, and leaning over the patient. We wanna use our upper body weight to help us do that consistent chest compression for a longer period of time than, than if we're trying to use our upper body strength. The second piece of that, when we do our full two to 2.4 inch deep compression, we wanna make sure that we come all the way back up and allow the chest to fully recoil before we give our second, third, and consecutive chest compression. The rate by which we're going to do these chest compressions is between 100 and 120 times per minute. That means we're gonna be delivering at least two chest compressions every second. And this is what it looks like. One and two and three and four and five and six and seven and eight, nine, 10, 11 and 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 1, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27, 28, 29, 30. Now I'm gonna do a head tilt chin lift. I'm gonna cover his nose and mouth with my mask, pinching his nose, opening his mouth. Now I deliver two rescue breaths. Now I know the two breaths went in because I saw a good chest rise and fall. Now I'm going straight back into my 32 inch to 2.4 inch deep compressions at a rate of 100 to 120 times two and three and four and five and six and seven and eight and ten and so on up to 30 followed by two more rescue breaths and we're gonna continue this 30 compressions to two rescue breaths until EMS arrives until an AED arrives on scene or until the patient starts to respond and breathe normally 